Hello and welcome to the very latest episode of FC Cymru. I'm Lawrence and I've hot-footed it from Denmark to Bangor for the end of International Week in a game between Wales Under-21s and what looks like an incredibly strong Portugal's team. Uh, coming up in the show, we learn a little bit more about mental health in football. We sent Abby along to find out about the work done by a Cardiff Met player. We also pay tribute to a Welsh cult hero. No prizes for guessing who. Uh, but first, we wanted to learn a little bit more about what it takes to organise an international overseas trip. So we sent Alex off to Gibraltar with the Wales under 18s. We're in a very nice hotel and a very nice terrace overlooking the sea. And we have a man to thank for this. And that man is Aaron, who has sorted all of this out. But not just us, because that's, that's a fair effort as it is. But Aaron, you have had to sort out 18 kids and all support staff, manager, physio, everything, to get everybody here. How? How does that happen? It's almost like a bit of a jigsaw. You've got lots of different elements which you've got to piece together. You've got the flight, you've got the hotel, hotel in the UK beforehand and a hotel here, uh, training venues, uh, transport, sort of how you're going to get from A to B, getting all the players from some players from North Wales, some from Aberystwyth, some from Halford West, some from Cardiff area, and how it's sort of getting all those players to Gatwick to, ready to fly here, because Gatwick's nowhere, really, nowhere near anywhere really. So. No, it is nowhere no. near anywhere at all. <laughs> so I mean, we, we basically just rocked up yesterday, but when did you start planning? Essentially after we came back from Ireland, so we came back from Ireland in sort of February, and that's when you start looking at this. So obviously we travel with, for this squad, 14. Uh, items and that's from large skips to uh, medical skips to wheelie bags and things um, and it was all about sort of getting them through the airport and checked in the oversized baggage and paying for that if necessary and then um, by the time we'd done that the, the team arrived and then it was a case of getting the team through the airport in one piece really and not losing anybody. Yeah because the, 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 your, your entire day must be constantly just counting, just counting heads Yeah. because you're trying to herd 16, 17, 18 year olds through an airport without losing anybody. Yes, so essentially at the beginning it's just about getting through security, so making sure that you've got 18 and, and the, st the staff look after themselves to some extent, but it's, it's more about the players just making sure that they all get through security in one piece and then uh, when you get into the gate you're always the last one make sure that they're all in front of you and you're the last one to board on the plane just in case one's wandered off to a toilet or disappeared somewhere to buy some duty free or something. But I mean, the itinerary is, is sort of it's incredibly detailed. I didn't appreciate how much. I mean, it, we, even when we get past the 4 a.m. start, 4:30 on the bus, get to the airport by such and such. When we got here, there was uh, training was scheduled. There was a pool recovery session yeah. uh, scheduled. Then there was downtime was included in team meetings. All that sort of stuff. Yeah. So we left the hotel around about eight o'clock this morning. Uh, myself, the kit man, and the physio um, brought the kit down early. Uh, just had a quick recce to make sure where the change rooms were, find out where we were having ice baths, uh, find out where the ice was, all that sort of thing, familiarise ourselves with the stadium. And then uh, everything's ready then, so everything's set up in terms of all the kits laid out, all the um, nutrition is all laid out ready, and everything's ready for the players to arrive. Uh, happy with how it's all gone then? Yeah, good result. Happy days. Pretty tough half that for Wales. The boys played really well, created a few opportunities, but my goodness, what a strike to put Portugal one up. Now, here at FC Cymru, we like to cover the whole spectrum to do with football. So, we've sent Abby along to Cardiff Met to meet the player who's been working on mental health awareness. Cardiff Met Football Club is different to every other in the Welsh Premier League. In order to play for the Archers, you have to be a student or alumni of the university. 
As well as skipper in the Archers, Bradley Woolridge is studying a PhD in student wellbeing and mental health. He's been out injured for over seven months, so I'm here at the King Cloyd campus this evening as he starts his comeback on the pitch and starts a new project off it. So Brad, you're back seven months out injured. How happy are you to be back in training tonight? Uh, yeah, I look forward to it. A little bit nervous because it's been such a long time. It's difficult to, you know, to be watching games when you're hoping that you could be playing. Um, but the boys have done really well. Um, you know, made a fairly good start to the season. But yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back, trying to get some fitness back and then, yeah, hopefully get back on the pitch. Obviously, playing at Cardiff Met, you have to study here as well in order to play. Could you tell us a little bit about your PhD? The PhD really came from um, from my time as, as president here. Um, my main sort of manifesto uh, agenda was to look at the student wellbeing and try and improve the provision that we offer. My PhD is really looking to try and firstly identify what the what the demands are to students um, in you know an ever changing environment and with such a diverse student population it, it's quite difficult just to put your finger on you know one individual thing. So hopefully then in the future how we can actually better support students. How important do you think it is that people see mental health as important as physical health? It's so important. I, I could just never understand and, and still sort of don't really how we we aren't educated around around mental health. You know, we all have some understanding around physical health. Mental health is, is so new to everybody, um, yet it's been, been here and been part of people's lives uh, forever. It's great to see that, you know, there's plans for schools to start embedding wellbeing into curriculum, um, starting to get a better understanding about ourselves, about our mental health. Um, and, you know, hopefully that will help to sort of eradicate the stigma that, that surrounds it and the discrimination. Um, and I think we're, we're on, on that journey at the moment, um, but there's still a long way to go. Do you think that football teams, football clubs, can play a role in eradicating the stigma? Oh, definitely. When they see people disclose and, and say, look, I've, I've suffered with mental illness, um, you know, I, they act as role models and, and, you know, make people, you know, feel okay that it's okay to disclose about mental health. Except people, you know, if they are ill, then they're ill, whether it's physical or mental. So, yeah, football's definitely got um, a great opportunity to, to help with that. So Christian, after seven and a half months out injured, Brad Woolridge is making his return to training tonight. How much of an important player is he to have back? I think it's a huge impact to have Brad back. He's been our captain for the last four years. Uh, he's synonymous with our achievements over the last few years as well. Um, and he's a great friend of all the players and, and he's been a big miss in training um, around the training ground um, and also on the pitch. And as, I, as we stated last week, it's been no coincidence that the clean sheets have, have dried up since Brad's not been in the team. How important is it for them to have that outlet aside from playing football? I think it's vitally important. Um, I, see, I think you see the pitfalls of the modern day footballer. Um, and yes, they get lots of money, but careers can be ended shortly. A lot of our players are now uh, are, are striving towards that academic route of masters, PhDs, because I think they can see that it, that it gives them a, a, a good future. I think the, the biggest thing, and speaking to other boys as well who go through um, injuries for a sustained period of time, is you just you start to lose your identity as a footballer. Everyone knows you as a footballer, you play for the football team. And as soon as that's taken away from you, and you know, without meaning to, you start you can start to become isolated. You know, you don't turn up to training or you don't turn up to a game, you know, things happen and, and you're not as involved as, as what you previously were. You have to sort of remember that and remember that, you know, regardless of how long your injury is, people want you back on the pitch, people still want you involved. I think definitely those going through, you know, moving towards um, a scholarship and moving towards possibly a professional contract, if, if they don't have anything um, alongside their football and, you know, for whatever reason they don't make it as a professional, um, they need something to fall back on. And we've got some great examples here of boys who, you know, have got to that sort of stage, may have had a scholarship or may have had a year or two as pro um, and then have then subsequently come here. And because they've had that education to go alongside it, it's meant that they can come here, they can continue the football, but obviously also um, become better qualified and better educated as well.
Hi, you join us deep in the second half. Still 1-0 to Portugal uh, and a pretty good goal it was as well. Uh, John, you've been watching the game. They've done OK, the uh, the youngsters, haven't they? Yeah, although they've been short of a few players because of the, the step up to the first team. Yeah, they've done OK. There's a few chances first half, which they might should have taken. But um, Portugal had a lot of the ball, so they've been, yeah, Portugal playing well. Yeah, absolutely. You were down there on Thursday, weren't you? And uh, how was it for you, the uh, the new look Giggsy team? Yeah, it was good to see. Good to see a lot of the youngsters get a chance. You know, um, Amper do play very well, obviously. Brooks and Lawrence played well again. Um, yeah, it was good. Positives. Very positive. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, there was, though, one man missing. Uh, and the first of the of the old guard, if you like, to retire. Obviously, no Hal robson Carnu. Do you have a favourite Hal Robson moment? Yeah, again, like a lot of other people, the, that goal against Belgium in the Euros was was a special goal. Um, one of the best I've seen for Wales, in fact. Um, yeah, I was at home with the boys watching it and went a bit, a bit crazy towards <laughs> when he when he scored that goal. Um, yeah, I think that's how he's going to be remembered. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we thought we'd pay a little tribute to Hal as he's a proper cult hero. So, Hal, this one's for you. In the deepest recesses of your mind, I want you to conjure up your memories, your thoughts, your hopes, your dreams about Hal Robson Carnu, a man who has given his all for Wales and has decided to hang up his boots for the next generation to take on the mantle. What, 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 does he, what did he mean to you as a player for Wales? The thing is, he's a player who always gave his all for the shirt, and everybody talks about the Belgium goal. But to me, we'd waited years for it to happen, but to me, the memory is. Bordeaux off the shin and just the pure elation when that goal went in we all went absolutely mental it was a hell of a day and still to this day one of my greatest ever experiences watching a football match it was a tight game as we all know and then all of a sudden he produces the best shinner I've ever seen in my entire life and basically once the game and is in folklore history you know for what mean a whale's great as he wheeled away, where were you? What was happening? Um, probably five rows down from my original seat. <laughs> um, just hugging my old man. Everyone's in tears, everyone's enjoying themselves. And all of a sudden then, we're on the road to the semi-final. Tell me your favourite home memory. i got to be honest, Scotland away, coldest night of my life. Went to one old penalty. We are all celebrating, turned round, didn't even see you went to 2-1. How Robson Carnu, like a salmon, bang, in the goals. Love it. It was beautiful. It was iconic, wasn't it? Yeah. It got so high. Brilliant. I've never seen an header like that in my life. Unbelievable. Off the field, I've got a lot of Howl memories that I probably can't mention, really good ones. Um, he's been such an uh, important part of the group, and obviously we're sad that he's retired, but it's obviously his decision. And then, um, yeah, no, he was, you know, we've got all good memories, I think, of Howe. And obviously on the pitch, the goal against Belgium was, was incredible. But, you know, I think maybe the one against Scotland was a good one as well. I don't know if you remember that in the snow, but just just one of the one of the. It was originals. the coldest night of my life. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you guys were really out there <laughs> running around in shorts. shorts on. Yeah. But I think he's just one of the originals. That's what we think. He's one of, he's one of the, you know, one of the main men and um, probably the first one that, that's gone now. So, uh, yeah, no, I think um, he's been a great teammate for years and, you know, he's someone that I call my friend and probably will always be a friend. Simon, we're 1-0 down against Belgium. It's tight. Only a crazy man would make a bet at that point, right? Yep, I was with a gang of friends in a pub in Swansea and we were 1-0 down and I told them, if you all put £20 in your pocket to cancer research, I will dye my hair if we win today. And obviously we did. A quarter to one, I was in a 24-hour uh, Tesco by Yen Blonde Day. Went home, left it in for too long, and I had orange hair for eight months. Hal Robson Carno, I blame you. Your memory, when you think of Hal and his Wales show, what is it? I think it's an obvious one. I think the Cruyff turn and goal in the Euros is, uh, you know, it's one of their moments that no one in Wales will ever forget. So, uh, you know, it's, he's a bit of a cult hero off the back of it, uh, an iconic moment. So, um, yeah, that's the moment I think of when you when you mention Hal's name. Where, where were you for the goal? What was it like? What happened? Uh, I was down the pub with my boyfriend, so in the middle of Bridge End, and as soon as he got the ball, everyone was already stood on their feet. And when it when it went in, everyone went nuts. The place erupted. It was amazing. I was probably about 20, 30 metres away 
was directly behind it. So uh, you could see as soon as he sort of done a couple of the players with the Cruyff, you could see he, you know, it was a great chance and he, he, he buried it, slotted it home. And then uh, obviously the euphoria of going ahead in a game like that. Does he do that in training? I mean, that was the thing, he did all that in training, didn't he? All the time, he was always pulling off that move, right? <laughs> No, that's how he was able to maybe sh surprise the defenders. <laughs> don't think anyone has seen him do it before, so uh, uh, we'll probably never see it again either. <laughs> <laughs>